Hello, welcome everyone to this webinar. The Develop of the Future Starts Here. I'm honored to have here today with me Vladimir. Uh, Vladimir is a technology evangelist with more than 23 years of experience leading global professional services, consulting, and delivery organization. He's a visionary leader. Vladimir approaches transformation through technology sourcing, cloud computing, global shared service, enterprise system, and optimize uh, of IT as a service. So Vladimir's experience includes working in more than 20 countries with projects spanning all over the world with budget crossing $2 billion. So he's definitely an expert, and uh, we are really glad that he's here with us tonight, today. So thank you, Tristana, for a nice introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Vladimir Baranek. I'm author of PCD, Professional Cloud Development Course, and I'm also um, CEO of Synthetic Spheres. Uh, let's start with uh, this slide, which is slide number 14 in our presentation. Uh, what we are trying to show here, it's a very nice section and a couple of slides we have about this of statistics and analysis about uh, current situation with the cloud. So let's start. The growth of cloud continues and the statistics shows that trends are highlighting the same issues. In the next few slides we will look at what is happening in industry. Um, the first big number we got is 204 billions from Gartner. Um, what does it mean is that this is the cloud market today and it's 16.5 percent increase from the last year which was 175 billions, and these are all these all, all these numbers are coming from Gartner. So hopefully everybody believe them. Uh, next, cloud application services or uh, software as a services are also expected to show an upswing with uh, more than 20 percent year over year growth, reaching 40 billions. Just quite big number considering that, uh, except couple of you know standard players like Salesforce, uh, NetSuite, Workday. Uh, there, that, this is the space where we do have a most of startups, so that number is growing very quickly. Uh, cloud management and security services have a more than 24% growth, and platform as a services 21% growth. And platform services is actually what we are looking for. This is application development. It's pure cloud native application development and it's quite strong. Next in a 2015 Evans study uh, found nearly three-fourths of organizations are currently using some form of cloud-based development tool today for more than 25 percent of their workloads. That means even if we are talking about infrastructure as a service, uh, you know, all the administrators, developers, everybody who is administering or operating any workload is switching from uh, standard tools to cloud-based tools, which is pretty significant. It means that um, you know they are able to seamlessly monitor and manage all workloads uh, across the clouds. Uh, so develop, uh, based on the computer world, developers have had the most impact on bringing cloud platforms into their businesses driven by shadow IT to solve needs and innovate quickly. Uh, amazingly, this means that developers are driving cloud adoption way faster by moving new applications and refactoring uh, of existing applications into the platform as a service platforms. And uh, as I already mentioned, majority of startups are focused on uh, software as a service development as the ultimate business, business model uh, for subscription-based offerings. Uh, almost all of the software as a service development, native cloud-based development, is running on uh, infrastructure as a service or platform as a service stacks. Um, so we do have a bit more statistics here. Uh, in this case, uh, this is from Salesforce 2016 State of the of IT report uh, featured on Forbes.com, in which uh, they surveyed global CIOs and IT leaders from U.S., Canada, Brazil, Australia, Japan, France, U.K., and Germany. What did they found? Well, 
79% of IT teams are currently developing cloud apps for customers, partners, and employees. 79%, that's a huge number. If you will compare it like three to five years ago, when you will find out that people are just trying to be early adapters or they're moving a couple of uh, workloads into the Amazon or somewhere. So actually, almost 80% of all developers in big companies are developing for cloud already today. Now, 68% of CIOs predicts they will spend more on mobile applications in the next two years. So obviously, they are focusing on mobility first uh, concept. And that that's definitely uh, cloud-based development. Uh, what they found next is that developing talent with IT skills development and training are second at 46%. So development, skill development of uh, cloud native developers is 46% of their priorities, which is, prob which is, as you see, second, first important thing on uh, for everybody. For if you are trying to do any cloud migration to move anything into the cloud development of um, IT skills in order to run it and develop anything under the cloud, it's, it's basically the most important thing. Once it's there, you have to do that. Now, 33% of IT teams struggle to keep up their skills with emerging technologies, and 32% struggle with lack of skilled developers. And that's exactly what we are talking today about, where we are trying, where we are finding out that we don't have enough skill developers with native cloud skills. We, there are so plenty of developers which are good, but they don't possess cloud skills. Uh, next slide. Uh, all right, at the same report uh, from uh, Salesforce, uh, we found, we find out, um, a bit more, uh, bit more uh, grass here for mobile applications, cloud migration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, as you see, those are all of them are big numbers, and um, it could be affected by the you know Salesforce this this report because that software is a service company, and everything what they do is uh, native cloud with their own uh, Apex language running on force.com. But those are, any, anyway, those are really significant numbers and uh, it's, it's just growing. Okay, well, let's go to the next slide. Um, this slide basically shows um, something very similar. Uh, it, it says, what is the lack of skilled developer here? It's 32%. Uh, that's a uh, pretty to person. It doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have developers. It's, it means they do have, there is a lack of skilled developers. That means cloud native developers. Uh, just below that, you get lack of resources for IT skills de development. And this is related for, uh, this is related to um, basically uh, infrastructure as a service operational uh, skill set, etc., etc. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Um, in all of these slides, we basically are saying a lot of things, a lot of things related to cloud demand and challenges. And uh, in this particular slide, the hottest skills of 2015 on LinkedIn, that this is the global statistic, says that um, number one, number six, number nine is related to cloud and cloud development. Those are the hottest skills on the on the market today, and we can uh, see very similar statistics on the next slide for from Computer World. So please go to the next slide, where what and these are these statistics are not just IT statistics, as you see, it's mixed with networking, with business strategy, etc. But number one is IT architecture. Number two is development. Number 
three, four, five, six, seven is cloud slash software as a service, which is also development, just different one. And then in three, three um, numbers down is web development. So if you will calculate everything together, we'll find pretty interesting number, um, which is really saying that cloud market is more than ready for cloud developers. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, go to the next slide, okay. And over here, uh, we see very similar uh, thing. What is important is if we, will uh, if we will combine cloud access and with programming and application development, it's the number one. It's uh, basically the development is number one for skills which are hard to hire. And uh, for me personally, it's not surprising. Uh, it might be surprising for a lot of people which were always telling us that, you know, you know, security is the biggest problem here. Uh, everybody acknowledged that. That's why a lot of clouds are, you know, um, focused on uh, um, compliance uh, requirements. You got HIPAA, PCI, etc. But skill set is something which is becoming more and more important once everybody's moving to the cloud. And uh, we will talk about security a bit later on, but definitely the skill set is something you can't just, uh, you know, buy by, you know, moving to the cloud. You actually need those people. Let's go to the next slide. And, 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 okay. And over here, what we see, number one at the right scale uh, state of cloud report this year uh, is lack of resource expertise. Um, and again, it's first in front of the security. Uh, not a surprise for me. Again, a lot, lot of surprises for other people. Uh, the main problem I see here is usually people are moving to the cloud or, you know, are um, doing this kind of decision based on a lot of business factors. And a lot of organizations are really not thinking about what about our developers. If they will outsource everything, it's still the same challenge. And uh, a lot of internal resources such as developers, such as uh, operating managers, are really not ready instantly for this plethora of technologies which are waiting for them at the cloud. It, it, you know, it really requires a different mindset. Okay, well, let's go to the next slide. All right. Um, so what we have here is uh, about time and money savings. What does it mean? Well, the Salesforce study found that 63% of companies uh, operating in the cloud can develop an application in less than three months. Three months. So, uh, obviously, this is a pretty general number, but it's interesting that if you will compare this number with uh, anything that was developed before the cloud, uh, it's pretty low. That means cloud is actually increasing the speed of development. And uh, uh, the statistic says that 72% of high-performance companies can generate an application in three months or less. In contrast, only 46% of underperformers can do the same. This ties into the level of investment that high-performing companies make in training, which is nearly twice as much as lower-performing companies. Uh, so high-performing IT teams um, are you know, 1.8 times more likely to spend on customer-facing applications. They are also 1.4 times more likely to plan on um, interest, increasing spending in mobile applications. So overall, 76% of high-performing IT teams predict they are increasing spending uh, on customer-facing applications and uh, mobile applications mostly. Uh, next slide. Uh, in addition to that, um, also Evans Data Cloud Development Survey revealed that 
cloud application development saves developer one hour of every eight hours. So, which means basically that cloud developers are eight times more efficient than standard developers. Uh, development on cloud platform reduces overall development time by an average of 11.6%. Uh, that's just different statistics about the same numbers. Uh, now, utilizing developers in cloud platforms enables streamlining the development process, including the ability to quickly get the development assets in online. Um, also, cloud developers have the ability to collaborate with other developers, architects, and designers on the development of the application. Uh, in, addition, in addition to this, majority of organizations are planning to spend most dollars on high performers, uh, which in translation means increased spending on true cloud developers delivering customer-facing and mobile application over the next two years. Uh, and this comes with a strong prediction to continuous growth be beyond this uh, period. In this section, we will start talking about um, our PCD professional cloud uh, course, what is inside, what we are trying to cover there. And before we will get there, uh, I'll, I will not spend uh, some short time period about general question where, where you know people are asking uh, what developers need to keep up you know uh, what is the characteristic for net next gen developer for cloud so we believe uh, there are four points in order to be a good next gen developer and they are architecture mindset cloud related skills devops master and cloud tool adoption uh, let's start with the first one, uh, architecture mindset. So historically, a responsibility of you know, deploying and operating this code is often handed to another group with a software developer having little input or knowledge of the production environment. Um, however, developers today must take a bit more holistic operational mindset approach to their work. They must really understand full stack engineering, including deployment automation and process and understanding of the infrastructure supporting the application and the non-functional characteristics of the application too. There are multiple areas related to this architecture mindset, um, to name just a few. Deployment topology, operational environment, um, points of failure, data encryption, access and authorization, scalability, key monitoring metrics, and more. Well, unfortunately, most developers don't approach development project with this mindset today. Uh, and as we move to the new era of cloud development, like deploying, configuring, and operating a cloud application, uh, it's much more important and more difficult than developing the function. Um, so what we are trying to say, say here in this uh, section uh, the architecture mindset is that developing itself is important, but it's uh, but the architecture is probably even more important in order to develop something which is uh, automated, robust, and which is uh, you know really resilient, which could be developed natively inside the cloud. Um, and it comes and starts with uh, architecture mindset. So next characteristic is uh, cloud-related skills. Well, cloud developers need to have a basic understanding of cloud resources and how they relate to one another. Uh, building cloud-native application is very different from building isolated package of application that runs behind a firewall. To do this effectively, developer must know multiple advanced techniques to scale applications, support monitoring, and accessing spanning multiple availability zones, uh, build automate uh, failover, implement replication, uh, integrate security protocols, etc. So cloud services are constantly evolving. They are more interoperable and granular than ever. A good example is uh, virtualized containers such as Docker, which eliminated the need for virtual machines. Therefore, enable transition from administrators to developers running their own environments. 
uh, cloud developers should deeply understand how to leverage cloud for developing very silent, high availability, and cloud, cloud native applications. Well, as at minimum, all cloud developers need to understand basic cloud capabilities if they plan to build cloud native applications. So this cloud related skills, this whole section uh, is basically focused on uh, uh, patterns, cloud patterns, and various techniques how to how to implement them. That's very important. And actually, this is part of our course where we are. I think even first of the sections, first module is related to this. All right, next characteristic uh, is uh, DevOps master is adoption of DevOps practices. Well, today in the era of access, anything is a service. It's necessary to operate your application within a cloud environment with re repeatable and reliable process in order to enable automated deployment and configuration of your cloud resources and components deployed to cloud. Um, the only way to effectively automate the delivery of changes to your applications running in the cloud, and uh, it's whether public, private, or hybrid, doesn't matter, is by following strict DevOps processes with, with assumption uh, there is no disruption to production environment, which is the most important piece because everybody is expecting, all right, I am paying for this, uh, software as a service on subscription based, it just must run. Uh, so everybody's quite surprised when suddenly Amazon is down or something is not working on. Um, it's also important to apply lean startup thinking when developing cloud applications. Fundamentally, DevOps practices are essential to continuous delivery of change. Uh, what does it mean? This whole, again, this whole section, this whole uh, characteristics uh, for DevOps master uh, is it related to real automation of deployment and orchestration and configuration on the run, which was not always possible on isolated environments or somewhere at the local on-premise data center. All right, the last one is. Uh, focused on uh, cloud tools adoption, the last characteristics. And uh, basically over here, what we are trying to say, all developers are moving for classic tools, for traditional tools to uh, DevOps tools. And DevOps tools are on high rise right, right now, uh, based on the right scale uh, state of cloud report from this year, 2016, uh, there is a huge uh, increase of DevOps tools used by developers, not of, not not uh, administrators, but developers. To name just a few is Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, uh, Mesosphere, etc. Uh, then, from container perspective, you got Docker, Kubernetes, Docker Tutor, etc. The increase is, uh, in some of those, more than 30% of usage from previous year. And the prediction is that for next year, uh, the plan is, uh, especially for container bears tool set, uh, more than last year, more than 30, 35%, which is amazing. That means in the last, from last year and, and uh, this year, the in, uh, increase of usage for DevOps tools is more than 60% than it was two years before, which is quite, quite, a, quite a bit of crazy, because if you think about that, many of those tools are running online only. Uh, I think a lot of people are amazed by that. And so this is the first slide, and we already talked a bit about the patterns. This is the first slide of uh, our um, of our PCD professional cloud uh, development modules. So actually, this is the first module over there. Uh, what I would love to highlight here that you know the whole course, everything what is inside is vendor neutral. Trying, we are trying to be objective, and it's uh, you know trying to point in the view of development in the cloud environment, and. Uh, it's pretty up. It's pretty uh, up to date today. I think uh, we, we are trying and we will try to update this course every year to to make it up to date. 
So this first uh, uh, module, Cloud Architecture Pattern, uh, let us take a look at a couple of things. First is multi-factor, uh, multi-form and platform factors, which means we are talking about target deployment models and platforms. Uh, next, uh, we will talk about cloud caching, uh, where we will distinguish between distributed and federated cache. Uh, from, part, from, from patterns perspective, we will also focus on RESTful versus RESTless services and um, session state management. Uh, we will, you know, examine um, quite important pattern designing for failure, uh, which is basically designing to expect failure. That means we have to expect everything can fail. Uh, it's a bit, bit uh, different approach than standard applications. The next is a bulk API for bulk data uploads with locking mechanism. Um, this one is quite important for big data and for uh, migration of data from on-premise to, to off-premise. Next one is stateful versus stateless, uh, quite important for a lot of people. Uh, and then we do have foundational knowledge about cloud parses in this uh, module is the last section. All right, let's go to the next one, the next slide. Uh, module two is, uh, you know, dedicated to service modularity, encapsulation and orchestration. Uh, and basically this is kind of connected to what we were talking before about DevOps. And uh, we are even, uh, you know, going a bit further here about with comparison between DevOps versus NoOps. Uh, a lot of people would ask what is NoOps. Uh, in my point of view, NoOps means that you really don't need anything, anybody from operational perspective to run your production, which for a lot of people seems like that's an nirvana or something nobody can achieve, but trust me, it's done uh, for a lot of companies. Uh, all right, so what we will talk about over here is a uh, migration and encapsulation of existing uh, legacy apps to a cloud platform. Next section over here is expo exposing business logic as a web service, which uh, from my point of view is a real enabler of business process as a service. Uh, you know, in historically, uh, we were trying to do that with SOA many years ago, software-oriented architecture, unfortunately, it was very bulky and um, today, um, not, there's still a lot of organizations, especially big organizations which are using SOA and I think it, there is still a place for SOA in this world, but uh, this is a bit different uh, business logic as a, as a web service and everybody who attend this course will, will hopefully understand why. Uh, next, uh, we will talk here about cloud messaging, that means message queues, uh, how to do that and uh, what, what, is, what are the important uh, uh, patterns of messaging. We will uh, look at the integration of database as a service, again very important part, um, we'll talk probably, um, you know, about SQL versus no SQL databases and why we still think that SQL databases uh, are important as well. Even though everybody today, you know, is uh, deploying and building a lot of applications on SQL databases, uh, you know, such as uh, MongoDB or, you know, memory databases, Redis, etc. Then we will talk about uh, transactional coding in the cloud, uh, which is again connected to, to databases. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, monetization techniques, a lot of people, for a lot of people, this is really interesting area, uh, how to make money on this. So we will talk here about license models. We will compare each of those. Uh, we will talk about developing forecast, uh, which is um, basically a cloud paradigm. And you will learn more again at the course. We will talk about hidden cost of cloud development because it, it really looks like it's for free. You know, it, you know, you will take the cloud tool and you will spin up a couple of instances uh, for free, or you know, you will deploy your um, 
node applications on Heroku and uh, you will use uh, free dino dinos. Mm. Well, that's true, but production is never for free. And even usage of a couple of tools or advanced subscription models are not for free. So that's why we will talk about hidden cost of cloud development, and especially if you are using uh, uh, different architecture blocks uh, and different providers. Uh, let's imagine you know you are going to deploy something at Amazon Web Services, and there are mu multiple blocks you will construct together for your uh, for your target architecture, and uh, I will guarantee it's not for free. Uh, we will talk uh, for so about software license models. Again, we will do a comparison of those. Then uh, we will talk about differences between in-source, outsource, and crowdsource, uh, crowd development, open source, etc. And at the end of this section, we will talk about monetizing applications through application markets. And further we will further extend this discussion about application markets and at a dedicated module later um, in this course. Well, let's go to the next slide. This is a pretty important topic. I think everybody understands that. Um, we, will, we will examine OAuth, SAML, and single sign-on supported in cloud environments. Uh, we will discover integration with identity as a service, which is uh, uh, basically a very important piece for a lot of cloud-only applications. They are seeking to integrate uh, existing identity as a service piece. That means that they don't have to build um, this sort of the, or, or this component by themselves. Uh, what are, again, we will talk about advantages and disadvantages here. Uh, we will talk about concept security at every layer. You know, we first we had you know security uh, parameterization, then we went back to deparameterization, and now at cloud we are talking about security at every layer. Although there are you know a lot of different points of view where we are saying that you know it's not just on every layer but on every component. But I think this is for a way longer discussion than we have today here. Uh, next, we will talk about custom security roles, uh, which are deployment descriptors. We will we'll dig quite deep in this subject. Another one is encryption and anonymization techniques. Um, so that means this is encryption and anonymization of data. And at the end of the module, we will talk about developing for compliance. That means we will quickly describe what it is and what are the you know compliance requirements uh, such as FISMA, FIPS 140, PCI, or uh, DSS? Let's go to the next module. Well, this is my favorite. Uh, I really love metadata and semantic. Um, so we will talk here about semantic fundamentals. We will examine uh, uh, semantic stack. We will talk about RDF and OWL, uh, OWL um, and we will uh, take a look at open metadata, metadata APIs, uh, which I, and we will also talk about linked data, um, which uh, is pretty much a very interesting fact, especially if you, if you are trying to develop something semantically based. Um, you know, a lot of people are really don't paying attention to this, uh, thinking, you know, it, that's just, you know, Wikipedia or a couple of triplets and we don't care about that. Uh, in the truth, uh, you know, reality is a bit different. A lot of developments are starting to be based on semantically based uh, metadata, semantically based databases. And uh, if you'll take a look outside and you will see that this section uh, is very humble in comparison to what is happening today and I'm guessing that we will update and extend, uh, extend this section uh, even more. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. Testing and deployment in the cloud, uh, quite important for a lot of organization. Um, what we will talk here is uh, cloud testing deployment and goals, why we are doing that and what are the deployment models. 
We will examine uh, generic stages of cloud and non-cloud testing and development life cycles. Um, we will uh, take a look at the utilization of crowdsourcing for massive cross-platform testing, uh, which is basically crowd testing. Uh, if you will take a look outside uh, and try to take a look at the landscape for crowd testing, then you will find out there are a lot of companies which are focused just on that especially for uh, mobile applications and uh, you know the business model behind it is usually based on a, a paper bug that means you don't pay per hour for all the tests but you can have like million testers for free and you will pay for for the bugs you have to fix uh, which they found out obviously for you and those guys doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, uh, just a regular folk somewhere from, uh, you know, development countries. Uh, they're all over the world and uh, many of them are really qualified to do this kind of testing, which is important to know. Uh, next uh, section over here is cloud testing automation. That means how to develop a script for testing. Uh, Another section talks about cloud components, uh, packages, and uh, solution testings. So, text, uh, so basically, we will take a look at the testing from architecture perspective. Then we will quickly examine uh, cloud testing frameworks, and we will compare public sandbox versus private sandbox features, uh, which is also important uh, because everybody thinks that you know sandbox is just a sandbox. There is no difference. Uh, well, there is and especially we'll find out at the testing stage. Next slide. Uh, scalable coding, uh, very important part of this uh, course. Uh, it, basically, from, from cloud developers perspective, we're expecting all code is scalable. Uh, otherwise, we can't do you know, application scaling. We can't do horizontal scaling, vertical scaling. We can do it by hardware, but that's not very efficient. So we need to build our application uh, with scalability in mind. And what we will learn here is uh, about polyglotism or coding languages in the cloud. Uh, that means that we will take a look at cloud native languages, non-cloud languages, we'll compare them, and uh, we'll take a look at overall history of the languages, which is very interesting. And um, a lot of people are surprised how their, you know, favorite language uh, developed from something they never thought about. Next section is designing to handle massive success, uh, where we'll talk about agility of developed solution. And the last uh, section, uh, very important, is performance engineering for scalability, reliability, and recovery. That piece is uh, covered with tips how to develop something which is scalable, which is reliable, and uh, which could recover. And there are a couple of very good slides uh, about how to do that. Next section. Uh, I'm, I mean, next uh, uh, screen, next slide. Thank you. Deployment automation and elastic sizing on environments. Uh, this is going more. Uh, to the uh, infrastructure as a service side, but it's still engineered, it's still developed, and uh, over here we are, in majority of the cases, using those uh, cloud native tools. And what we what we will talk here is service and application deployment into public, private, and community clouds. So even if you are developing something very small, you want to deploy it into the cloud, and how to do that? And uh, we will, part of this section, talk about automated cloud bursting. That means how to actually burst from one machine to, the, to another machine. And uh, so again, this is more situated or more focused on infrastructure as a service uh, engineering, but it's important part of the job, I believe. Next slide. In this module, we will basically go deeply down into platform as a services and we will um, basically really focus on a tenant aware application development um, 
everything what is uh, development related uh, has some core and I believe the core is here in platform as a service development for cloud development. So over here we will really talk about understanding differences between native platform as a services and cloud enabled platform as a services. Uh, you know the platform enabled platform as a service is the term uh, coined by Gartner many years ago and uh, it, it is basically not native platform as a service. It is something which, was, which is able to run uh, out of the cloud. Good example could be you can take a look at the you know Java runtime machine. You can run Java runtime machine without any cloud. Uh, but there are platform as a services like uh, Bluemix from IBM, which is dedicated to development of Java. For example, obviously they are de they are able to you are able to develop anything else over there. But the thing is that it's not native uh, platform as a service and. Uh, but obviously it has additional features, additional libraries. It has DevOps which enables you to use it as a platform, as a regular platform as a service. And sometimes uh, cloud enabled platform as a services are even more uh, important for, um, for um, in, uh, corporations because they will, they will enable them a very easy uh, migration from uh, you know, on-premise to off-premise development. Same applies to Microsoft Stack with you know, Microsoft Azure. Next section here is platform scalability and importance of, all platform, of open platform APIs. Uh, next one is isolation of tenant customizations and extensions to business logic. Uh, next section is horizontal scalability to support real-time addition of new tenants of users. A couple of sections are related here for, uh, to isolation. So we do have one uh, for isolation of tenant execution characteristics, where we are basically talking about uh, performance and availability isolation. And then the next one is isolation of tenant workspace. Uh, this is basically dedicated to memory, how to isolate memory for particular tenants. Uh, then tenant aware, aware error tracking and recovery, a very important one. Uh, if something you know is um, something crashed, something is broken, it's very nice to know which tenant it is, and it's very nice to know that it's me, and uh, I can catch this error and I can you know recover from that and continue as a in production. You know, last section here is uh, dedicated to multi-tenant data access controls. So we'll take a look at some of the data access. Uh, uh, concepts how to how to do that from multi-tenant environment. Uh, I wish to spend more on this section because this is I would say most important section uh, and it's I think the biggest one in, uh, in our course uh, but unfortunately we have limited time so let's go to the next uh, slide. Next one is uh, dedicated to platform as a service application architecture models and we are comparing the choices and appropriate application architecture concepts in a given scenario here. So we do have some scenario and we will compare different concepts how to fulfill that particular scenario. And over here we will learn about open source and technology driven, driven platform as a services. And we will also talk about cloud enabled data access frameworks. Um, next slide. All right, this slide is dedicated to interoperable cloud code. And uh, we will take a look at uh, different interoperable platforms uh, which are supporting this requirement. Uh, we will understand device-based platforms. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, we will learn what is the code share, that means how to sh how to share code source code across organizations? You know, a lot of people, a lot of developers are using today GitHub, Bitbucket, those kind of uh, you know repositories for code sharing, uh, but also for business purposes. And at the end of this module, we will uh, talk about cloud persistent coding. So we will take a look what is the per and 
talk about what is the persistence and how to code persistently. Uh, next slide. All right, this, th these two last modules are uh, really devoted to software as a service. And this first one is um, really about service catalogs and application marketplaces. So, you know, if you go to, you know, any application marketplace, you can download software. You, you can go to, you know, Apple, you know, Apple Market, you will download the application, etc. That's actually a service catalog, it's, and it's crossing multiple domains, uh, but usually that's just for one device, one, for one category or class of devices. Over here, we will also talk about cross-platform application cloud catalogs and markets, so which are crossing more than one device and more than one uh, market. We will also talk about developing applications as uh, software as a service solutions. Uh, for deploying to application stores. What does it mean? Uh, well, it means that you will learn how to uh, deploy your application and uh, go through the process of, uh, uh, of uh, applying uh, to, for, for publishing your application within the particular market. I think we do have all examples for Microsoft, uh, there for, uh, you know, for Apple, for Android, all these uh, all these uh, application stores. How to apply to for you know public, to publish my application to these particular market stores as well. Then uh, we will uh, learn about developing applications as software as a service solutions for single and multi tenancy models. So what is the difference? And at the end of this uh, uh, this module, we will talk about bring your own device concepts. Uh, how do they, uh, you know, apply to to the to your development? And basically, what are the benefits? And uh, obviously, there are also some disadvantages, but mostly benefits. And uh, we also have to learn how to uh, how to incorporate this kind of thinking into the application development as well. Next module. All right, this is the last module in uh, my section, and uh, the name is uh, Mashups and Open APIs. Um, basically, the whole module is really devoted to APIs, application interfaces. So we will talk here about API development. We will really focus on Mashup orchestration and workflows. That means, uh, you know, you can really do API development uh, just by coding, hard coding or coding with, with uh, you know meta sections, or you can do it uh, in visual way. Uh, so a good example would be you know you can go to MuleSoft and uh, that this is basically integrated integration uh, platform as a service. And at the MuleSoft you do have this uh, visual uh, map mapping you know designer. Where you can map APIs and create micro services. Basically, a mashup started as something smaller, something which will enable enable us just connect a couple of APIs together. But today we are talking about microservices and very important shift if uh, uh, from a, you know old concept with SOA to a new online uh, dynamic uh, microservices concept running between the APIs. So that's a, that's a really the part of the orchestration workflows we were talking about here. And again, you could, it could be hard-coded, could be dynamic, and could be visualized. Uh, then we will take a look at Meshup framework landscape. Uh, so what are the major players there? We will speak about mobile coding for a bit. Uh, for that, you know, I will always suggest dedicated course because that's a huge topic, but uh, we will try to distinguish what are the differences between mobile and non-mobile coding over here. Uh, we will take a look at major social APIs and we will uh, basically try a couple of examples and we will uh, um, examine major open APIs such as Google, eBay, YouTube, and SoundCloud. And uh, that's 
all of in what is in this course and that's, that's all what is in my section. Uh, thanks everybody for listening to me. If uh, there is any question, uh, you know, I'm always able available to answer. Um, hopefully Tristana will guys give you my uh, email. Uh, the third question is, uh, yeah, to make it short, uh, this uh, person is a consultant and uh, has been asked to evaluate OpenStack and uh, you would like to know your opinion about OpenStack, like also knowing shortly what it is and what does it mean for a company to use OpenStack instead of VMware, for example. Uh, that's a fair question, thank you. It's a very good question, actually. Uh, part of my job is that I work also for IBM as executive um, advisor st strategy for Fortune 500 and uh, this is quite relevant question the people are always asking me this question, uh, but not just from obviously development perspective, but generally. So, if you are asking why OpenStack, uh, it's quite simple. It's open. Uh, all those uh, components over there are constantly developed. It's it's not. It it is not a shell where it's not empty. It's full of uh, you know high-profile companies, such as VMware as well, such as IBM, such as Intel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you and uh, the major probable question is why OpenStack? Why not VMware? Uh, well, it depends. Depends what if you are a uh, VMware shop uh, and you you run everything on VMware, then probably you would use VMware also in your in your cloud. But if you are not, or if you are you know seeking forward to merge more um, you know hypervisors together, OpenStack is very good. Uh, choice for that because basically you can really have different uh, hypervisors uh, and uh, you can use OpenStack API on top of that you can uh, put a couple of other tools which will create for you a single pane of glass for which you can uh, you know you do your you know integrated and automated self provisioning etc. From development perspective OpenStack is developed from the ground. It's not it's not a proprietary software. There is a huge community of people developing on each layers of OpenStack. Uh, good example is in IBM we do have a, a, a OpenStack manager uh, a piece of software which is basically running on top of OpenStack API and which, enab which enables to you know provision from the OpenStack uh, you know, VMware uh, images, hyper uh, hyper -V -V images, uh, power -V images. You know, v images from mainframes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it really depends what's your purpose, what you're trying to do. But generally, OpenStack is well maintained. It's full of people. It's very progressive. And uh, whether somebody should, you know, spend your his or her time on OpenStack as a developer. I would say that's very beneficial, not just for the individual, but uh, for uh, for everybody around. And moreover, uh, again, this seems to me OpenStack seems to me like one of the winner from uh, you know open source perspective. Um, this person is asking if there's any difference between uh, YAS, PaaS, or SaaS. So from infrastructure as a service, platform or ser so software as a service, which one? Like, if, is there a difference in terms of security? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, uh, thank you for asking. So, there are vast differences between these security uh, uh, approaches for each of XAS layers. Um, basically, we were already talking about, uh, you know, security on each layer, security on each uh, component which is a bit different than, uh, you know, perimeter-based security or deparameterized security. Uh, Jericho Forum from Open Group uh, said that it's a basically deparameterized security. You are doing security on component level. You do security only on the component where you really need that security. Otherwise, it's just, you know, uh, it's just trying to catch a fly in the air. You, you don't have to be successful. From from a uh, you know provider perspective, IS, PAS, SAS, it's a it's a different story. IS usually people are asking for a compliance uh, you know base security like HIPAA etc. or FISMA, and that means that 
everybody who is running or everyone who is running um, IS based security, that security is not just particle rack, it's the whole data center, it's connection between the data center, it's a you know, it's a connection with you with uh, internet providers. It's it's everything on the infrastructure layer, and so what they are saying that the infrastructure security for infrastructure as a service, uh, the responsibility is divided. Obviously, it's divided from uh, um, from the ground physical level up to the you know uh, software defined data center. Um, that means if you are talking about I don't know Amazon or software, then it's up to your uh, VM. Above VM, it's your security. Up to the VM, it's a security of a particular provider. For platform as a service, it's very similar, but platform as a service could use any infrastructure as a service provider. So, so from your perspective, it's always matter of perspective. So from your perspective, your platform as a service provider is is um, you know, taking care about the security of everything except your application. That means even for VM, etc. But particular platform as a service provider, you know, is just encapsulating security from infrastructure as a service provider, etc., etc. As we will go higher in the XAS stack, it's always smaller portion of security. Uh, but the generally, from compliance requirements, uh, infrastructure must be hardened for particular uh, compliance requirements. And if uh, there is no requirement for that, then uh, it's just a regular model with uh, uh, divided security between the layers. So this person is, uh, has received a request from a client uh, to develop an hybrid cloud solution and is wondering if you have some recommendation for the kind of uh, developer's profile that he needs to search for or if it doesn't matter, is the same for a public or private cloud. Yeah. Good question. Uh, my personal opinion is it really doesn't matter uh, whether it's public, private, or um, you know hybrid. That's just a deployment model, right? Obviously, if you do have some applications which are leveraging uh, combination of deployment models, that that would be probably a different answer. But generally, it doesn't matter. Uh, we are not talking or we are not really focusing when we are developing the cloud applications um, on uh, deployment models. We are focusing mostly, if we are talking about infrastructure service, we are focusing mostly uh, on uh, uh, you know, application scalability uh, in the horizon. That means horizontally and obviously on availability zones. That means that if uh, Amazon is running today uh, like, I don't know, seven to nine, standard availability zones within the US and more than 20 within the world, then basically I'm distributing my applications into those availability zones. First first thing, because I have to be closer to my consumers, that means that there, there is no latency issue. And then secondly, obviously, if there are more availability zones within major availability zone, that means that I do have more uh, options to, you know, for failover and for, um, you know, horizontal scalability in particular geopolitical region, it's good to me because basically I don't need backup, I don't need, uh, I don't need a DR. Uh, that's that's it. You, you know, if one availability zone is down, another is up, and it's just serving the same customers. So, really, developing uh, is at least from my perspective. Not that much, you know, connected to what cloud you're developing for. Uh, however, if we are talking about engineering for infrastructure as a service, that's a different story, uh, which means that we could do, again, uh, uh, development of, uh, you know, orchestration of some microservices or some orchestration or some automation of cloud bursting between the clouds. That's a completely different story. It really depends what we are trying to develop. Hopefully, I answered the question. If they recommend any publication to prepare for this certification, and uh, first I will say something that is uh, for this to get this certification, you need to pass the exam, and in order to attend the exam, you need to attend the training. So you need to find an accredited training partner. But uh, I will actually ask to Vladimir if he 
um, suggest any additional uh, material or tool or online uh, mock exam uh, sorry courses that can help any way to prepare for the examination Vladimir do you have any suggestions absolutely I mean uh, you know today <laughs> again at, at the, at the at this era is of, so, uh, of software as a service there are a lot of providers for you know trainings and certifications and but they do have different goals in their mind uh, so especially in your slide you got in front of everybody right now potential certification pass they are showing some of those providers right for you know particular uh, vendor technology or particular uh, you know um, section of technology Basically, if you will go to Udemy as example, which is the biggest online provider of trainings today, U D E M Y, you you can you know download it on your mobile or you know run it on your uh, browser or even you can, it's running even on Apple TV everywhere almost. What does it mean? There are millions of trainings and millions of people trying to learn something and many of those trainings are cloud related and many of those are cloud related to these technology players you've got in front of you. Good example would be um, you know IBM or Amazon Web Services. There are, there are dedicated uh, trainings for Amazon Web Services for each of those components for even for architecture and even for certification path within the Amazon Web Services. So I think that's a good source where you can start. And I personally spend there probably eight to 16, eight to 16 hours every week uh, because there are a lot of new things coming every week. So I highly, I highly uh, you know, appreciate what those people are doing there. Many of those are not for free, but nobody's probably expecting it's supposed to be free. But the prices are very reasonable. You can some of them are for five dollars, some of them are for twenty, thirty. I think the the biggest one which I found was was for uh, thirty five bucks. That was the highest price I ever paid anywhere for for training on Udemy.com. And a lot of trainers over there are professionals which are doing an excellent job. That's it. Thank you very much, Marini. So I think we can close this webinar. We don't have any other question. And uh, so please, uh, let's keep in touch with the Cloud Credential Council. If you want to have more information, you will find these recordings and our other webinars recording and the slides on the CCC website. And if you have any, any queries, just yeah, write us an email and we will answer. We will try to help you in uh, resolving your cloud problems and uh, improve your cloud skills. So Vladimir, please uh, accept uh, my grateful thanks. You have been amazing. You did a wonderful job. And uh, let's see uh, next time. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.